story of Scott Horton. Uh, Scott Horton was kind enough to, to join us uh, pretty much in a kind of a last minute thing to help spread light on all the craziness that's going on in the Persian Gulf. Uh, specifically, everyone knows that we've been covering Iran over the past couple of months. And I think it's about time that we get Scott Horton on uh, to deliver his take. Scott, how's it going, man? I'm doing good, Henry. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. So the first thing I wanted to ask you before we get into all the craziness going on with these, these just nutty neocons like John Bolton, um, I wanted to get your take on the Democratic debates because my take on it with, with, with at least Tulsi Gabbard, and, and that's really what I'm referring to, my take was that when Tulsi Gabbard corrected Tim Ryan on a very, very you know, simple fact that the Taliban were in fact not the people responsible for 9-11, and that's not a pretext of why we should be engaged in Afghanistan, <laughs> Tim Ryan made a terrible blunder, and I thought was, of course, maybe he could have misspoke or whatever, but I think it's just an indictment on all these U.S. representatives who, are, who have stood on the Armed Service Committee or the Sub-Defense Committee. This guy should know his shit, shouldn't he? Like, I, that's what I got out of it. So I'm just, here, I, I'm just curious to hear your take. Like, are these people who are actually on these committees, do they know anything that's going on in the world? Yeah, good question. So a couple of things there. First of all, I don't know anything about this guy previous to that argument. So I don't know what he knows or not. He actually, one of his rejoinders to her, one of the first things he said was, I know the Taliban didn't do it. Like, in other words, he wasn't exactly trying to say that. What he, re what he really was doing, I think, though, is just as bad, which is he, it's the Lindsey Graham, you know, general flag, whoever you got, you know, official war party line is that we didn't occupy Afghanistan on September 11th and September 11th happened. Therefore, we have to occupy Afghanistan to prevent September 11th from happening. And it's just sort of as simple as that. That's the way they look at it. And, you know, in fact, I've heard Lindsey Graham dismiss the entire idea of blowback by saying, but we didn't have troops in Afghanistan before September 11th. In fact, if we had, maybe we could have stopped them. We should have had troops there. We're completely ignoring the fact that it wasn't troops in Afghanistan. It was troops in Saudi Arabia that motivated Al-Qaeda who weren't Afghans, who were Saudis and Egyptians. And they were the ones who were targeting the United States. And it was having the troops in Saudi that had provoked the attack. So, in other words, this is sort of a typical Republican Party uh, kind of deliberate obtuseness about how, you know, from their point of view, they would have you believe that history began on September 11th or that anything that did happen before September 11th that had anything to do with September 11th, it was always a lack of intervention, a lack of willful engagement. It was Bill Clinton being too much of a pacifist that got us attacked rather than anything that he did, you know, actively to provoke it. And they almost, they just virtually never questioned that. I mean, you could just the only person who has truly questioned that in American public life in the last 20 years was Ron Paul, because he kept going back to it over and over again, that it was our side who started this war. That doesn't make them the good guys, but it means that in order to end their side of the war, we need to end our side of it. And, um, but otherwise, I mean, that's just essentially it's verboten. And in fact, and Tulsi Gabbard never says that. Tulsi Gabbard blames radical Islam, Salafi Islam, because the fact that Ayman al-Zawahiri and bin Laden are, you know, bin Laden's dead, but, you know, the fact that they are Salafi, you know, right-wing religious radicals, that's why they hate us, that's why they attack us, that's why they kill us, which is no different than Dick Cheney's lie. They hate us because their evil, sick, twisted religion makes them hate goodness and innocence. And the better and the more innocent and the, the more we fear Jesus and the more we love our children, the more they want to kill us. And what a bunch of garbage. It's just not true. Yes, they are Islamists, but that's who they are. That's not what they do. That's not why they attack the United States. And that may be why they want to create a caliphate in Western Iraq. But the reason they attack the United States is because the United States stands in the way of that, even though that's thousands of miles from here. 
Yeah, the one thing I do appreciate about Tulsi is that she does make – she draws out the line between Muslims as, and, uh, like, radical jihadists. Like, she, she directly says, like, Saudi Arabia funds these crazy madrasas that fund – and sponsor the ideology that you know this terror comes from yeah but so that's a- total nonsense that's like blaming all born-again christians for the american military that's completely stupid it's a massive category error look at the fact that 99 percent of all salafis aren't violent what does that tell you that that's not what's going on here well of course like what's going on is blowback for our imperial escapades over there in the first place so And believe me, look, if you want to talk about crazy born again Christians in the U.S. Air Force who really believe that their role in this world is to cause a nuclear war in order to force Jesus Christ to come back faster on their timetable. I'm here to tell you, there are people like that with power in our military, especially in the Air Force, who are essentially as bad as holy warriors as the most fundamentalist Jews or fundamentalist Christians in the whole land or fundamentalist Muslims in the holy land that you could find. And, and yet, if you were to say that American policy in the Middle East is a Christian crusade against Islam, that would just not be correct at all, would it? Oh, and no, no, no. So, certainly they can see it that way, and they like to frame it that way from their side, that that's what they're up against. And maybe there are some American military men who feel that way, but does that sum up the policy? Does that mean that that's what all is going on here? Of course not. And the same kind of thing on their side. And all Tulsi Gabbard has to say is, listen, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan backed these guys. George Bush and Bill Clinton betrayed them. George Bush refused to protect us from them and then used their assault on our country as an excuse to kill two million people who didn't do anything to us at all. And all we have to do is just quit. That's what Ron Paul would say, just the truth. Instead, she wants to say, oh, look, I'm against supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria, but I'm all for killing Al-Qaeda in Syria. And that's wrong. That is the wrong answer. The entire war on terrorism is a giant bogus screw job in the first place. And so she's certainly right that we should not be backing the only actual enemies the American people have in the world. But the war against them is just as bad. See, for example, what they did in Pakistan the, the war against Al-Qaeda in Pakistan only created Afghan ISIS. The war against Al-Qaeda in Yemen only ended up creating the giant civil war that led to Obama taking their side against the Houthis and this giant catastrophe. It, it's true the rest of the time, it's mostly a bait and switch against secular leaders by Saddam or Gaddafi or Assad. But still, you know, the war on terrorism itself is also, you know, kills innocent people, is terribly destructive and counterproductive. And so, in other words, she gets a solid B, I guess, and that's grading her on a curve against a bunch of horrible idiots and liars and warmongers and Israeli talking point repeaters. But if she's going to sit here and say that they hate us because their brand of radical Islam makes them into our enemies and that therefore we must continue to fight them for the next eight years of her presidency, then she doesn't have my support at all. Yeah. And it's interesting because radical Islam is just something you've said this before. The last time you were on the show, it's not, and I use a talking point. Um, It's radical Islam is basically something that sounds scary enough that it can't be reasoned with. And it's vague enough that it can really apply to anything and meanwhile it's like these, assault weapon yeah right? exactly it's like assault weapon it means the ayatollah khomeini and it means his blood sworn enemy iad al-baghdadi or whichever baghdadi is the ruler of isis now they're enemies together but they believe in their religion like what does that even mean radical that means that they're sincerely pious rather than just posturing like american christians who are christians on sunday mornings and forget about all the teachings the rest of the time Is that what makes someone a fundamentalist is that they actually believe in the faith that they profess to believe in? Um, That someone who would fight you for having combat forces on his soil. And in fact, you know, I talk about this in the book. Look at the September 11th hijackers. Some of them spent their last few nights on earth down at the strip bar doing blow. Right? These were guys who they were political radicals. And maybe some of them were religious radicals too. 
but it was their political radicalization that was an issue when it came to kamikaze crashing those planes into those buildings and killing those people that day. Which, by the way, of course, was meant to provoke an overreaction, which is exactly what it did. And what I find interesting, radical Islam is really just applied to everyone. It's applied to Iran. It's applied to Shiite Sunnis. Just literally everyone that gets in the way of U.S. foreign policy. It's all radical Islam. And it's just like my take has always been that it's just used as a way to get the Christians, the, the, the Christian Republican base from America to support this, this, this holy crusade war where these people are going to come and they're going to somehow, they're going to take over Israel first. And then they're going to like, like Israel is like the country that protects Europe from the, from radical Islam. <laughs> it's that kind of weird narrative. I think they don't even know what their geography is. Like they, they, right. they really think. And I've said, if you want to make a case of anyone's doing that, if anyone is actually like really on the ground fighting terror, then it's Assad. And then saying stuff like that, people will call me an Assad apologist and stuff like that. I'm like, I'm not Assad. Like, I, I always say, like, no, Assad's, Assad's the government. The government's never the good guy. But at least he's fighting Al-Qaeda. Yeah, and Al-Qaeda that's backed by the CIA, who guess who are the worst guys? The CIA, the same guys that put Osama bin Laden in power in the first, I mean, who built up bin Laden, same CIA who helped install Saddam Hussein and his party in power in Iraq way back in 1958, supported him all the way through, well, with a couple of breaks, but mostly they supported him all the way through, uh, certainly since he took over the country from 79 all the way through 1990, when they invited him to go ahead and invade Kuwait if he felt like it before they turned against him. The same CIA who turned over guilty and innocent people to Bashar al-Assad to be tortured under Bill Clinton and under George W. Bush. And it was that CIA that was back in, again, yeah, Al-Qaeda, the suicide bombers, the guys that attacked our towers, the guys that attacked the coal, the guys that were the worst part of the Sunni base insurgency in Iraq War II that killed 4,000 out of the 4,500 Americans who died in that thing. And the CIA backed them. So, again, grading on a curve, of course Assad is the good guy in that situation when his enemies are suicide bombers who target elementary schools. Now, this is a good segue into what actually happened the other day on 4th of July. Um, so, this Iranian, I don't know if we should peel this back a bit, but, or maybe we just start here and see where it goes. Uh, so, this, this Iranian tanker, seized by the UK um, under the pretext of them violating of them violating EU sanctions on that were put on Syria in 2011 and I find that funny because I always thought other countries complain about about the US when we when we put sanctions on a country and we force every other country in the world to abide by them and to enforce them as well I mean, isn't that, what the, isn't that the same thing that Europe is doing by uh, seizing this ship? Because, I mean, they're not Iranian sanctions, they're EU sanctions. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. Of course, the Americans and, and all the European allies were in on this plot against Syria from 2011 on. In fact, one of the first reports that we had from the summer of 2011 was Eric Margulies came back from France. Maybe he was still even in France when I talked to him. He wrote a thing about how he has intelligence sources, military sources at the highest levels, very connected in France, Eric Margulies, and that French special operations troops are on the ground in Syria right now helping to organize the violent resistance. And we knew that by August of 2011, maybe before that. Um, Phil Giraldi's piece was called, in the American Conservative, was called NATO versus Syria. And it was all about how this is our allies. This is, uh, you know, France, Britain, and Germany are with us in this. Or I don't know about Germans, but certainly France and Britain. And, you know, it's funny. It's the kind of thing where if you really don't know about it and you're hearing about it for the first time, it sounds too crazy to be real. That America would, after fighting Iraq War II, essentially the entire war was against the quote unquote, Sunni based insurgency, the people who were losing power to the Shiite side that America had taken in the civil war there. 
to think that just a couple of years later, Barack Obama is going to turn right around and back that very same Sunni-based insurgency. And, and not just a Sunni-based insurgency, but literally the guys from Al-Qaeda in Iraq. They had renamed themselves the Islamic State of Iraq way back in 2006, declaring exactly their intention to go ahead and create a state sooner rather than waiting around till later. And from the very beginning of the Syri war, another thing, actually, this predates Eric Margulies' uh, story about the French was a story by Alistair Crook in the Guardian Observer about how Prince Bandar is sending jihadis from Saudi to go fight, just like in Iraq War II, when Saudi was backing guys against our soldiers in Iraq War II. Same program again, now in Syria. So from the very beginning, we knew, hey, if the Saudis are sending jihadists to fight, we know what this looks like. This is Al-Qaeda in Iraq. These are suicide bomber berserkers, you know, Zarqawi's guys. Uh, you know, essentially that whole group that had been marginalized by the so-called Sunni awakening and the Sunni tribes in Western Iraq in 2007 and 8, Barack Obama and John Brennan, David Petraeus and Hillary Clinton, Leon Panetta, they were taking the, those shock paddles and resuscitating, what do you call those things? The defibrillators and, and resuscitating Al-Qaeda in Iraq that had almost been completely destroyed and brought them back to life and back them against Assad. And why? Just because Assad is friends with Iran. And yeah. we, can, we can't take Baghdad back from the Shia and undo Iraq War II, but as a consolation prize, maybe we can get rid of Assad and that'll bring Iran back down one peg after we put him up too. And so that was the whole reason they did it. And, and yes, it is high treason. It is absolutely... You know, John Brennan and Barack Obama, what they did makes Benedict Arnold look like George Washington. Simple as that. There has never, it's unprecedented in all of American history, in any part of American history, that you would have our government take the side of our enemies so blatantly like this. I mean, a line with Stalin against Hitler, that wasn't a secret. Everybody knew what was going on there, and Stalin wasn't really our enemy at the time. And the deal was, yeah, he's bad, but we're, that's the alliance. But this is not like that. They spent five years going, oh, no, we're only backing moderate rebels. Oh, no, we're only trying to create a democracy there. When, in fact, they were backing suicide bomber, you know, jihadist crazies. And um, it's a hell of a war, man, I'll tell you what. And, and, and just like really with Iraq War II as well, it's like the slowest motion train wreck in the world. If you know who's who in 2011 and you're watching this whole thing unfold throughout you know, as the war took place through, you know, uh, at least the time the Russians came and intervened and put a kibosh on it all. I mean, you're talking four, four years, five years of just total madness of the highest treason and getting away with it. And like you were just quoting a minute ago, shaming the hell out of everybody who knows better. Oh, you're some kind of a sod apologist. <laughs> you're an apologist for the CIA backing Al Qaeda. And you think that you got the moral high ground against me for saying that the secular government that used to torture these terrorists to death for Bill Clinton and George W. Bush is not the worst one in the situation when he's up against guys who will cut your heads off for not converting, you know, I mean, which they did, you know, the, on those sort of guys. Are you telling me that Al Zinke isn't moderate? <laughs> in fact... The, the one, the guys who are on picture There's an or no video out there. It's, it's actually, you, you might be surprised to hear this. The child that they murdered in the back of that truck was actually not a child. It turns really? out, and I'm pretty sure this comes from his actual sister. It could be propaganda, but I'm pretty sure that this is correct, that he was actually 19 and very much was a fighter in the pro regime resistance against the CIA back terrorists there. And, I don't know whether they knew that or not when they cut his head off. He sure looks like he's 12 in the picture. Either way, it cut off the head of a 19-year-old. That ain't much better. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying. But because that story went so viral on the anti-war side, that look at what moderates these guys cutting that child's head off. Seems like, you know, it's important that when we have, um, you know, contradictory information later that comes in to clear things up that we, you know, go ahead and clarify that too. They're still head-chopping murderer terrorists 
but it's just on that one particular anecdote, the kid was a few years older than he appeared. So. Yeah, but like you said, I mean, you can't, no matter how old somebody is, you can't moderately chop somebody's heads off. You can't no. eat someone's organs moderately. It's a little bit different story, though, than, oh, my God, look yeah, at them absolutely. behead a 12-year-old boy. You know, he well, actually had been a fighter. That's interesting because that was one of the first, because I, when I was younger, I was a neocon little bastard uh, in, my, in my unwise years, and, and I gradually changed. Um, that story, that picture was that it had a huge effect on me. That changed me um, almost entirely to become an anti-imperial activist, really. So, I mean, it's interesting that he was older. I haven't heard that yet. I, that, that is, actually, no, I've heard uh, contradicting reports of how old that, that kid was. But, I mean, regardless, it was just yeah. clearly... Well, uh and like you're saying, that's pretty, there's some pretty serious cognitive dissonance that you got to go through there when you look at that picture and you go, wait, these are the good guys. These are the guys we've been backing. This is the USA's moderate rebels here to save the people from the secular fascist dictatorship. Really? However old that kid was, these are the moderates? They don't seem too moderate to me. They seem like war criminals. And in fact, going back to the very beginning, the Northern Storm Brigade that posed on the porch with John McCain, that he posed on the porch with them, they had kidnapped and I think murdered or, or sold uh, a bunch of Lebanese Shiite pilgrims. They also were the same ones who later kidnapped Stephen Sotloff and sold him to ISIS, who cut his head off. And before McCain met with the Northern Storm Brigade, they were already on the record, on video, talking to Time Magazine in English, saying, yeah, we're veterans of Iraq War II. We fought the Americans in Iraq, meaning they were the foreign fighters. They, were the, they would have been called Al-Qaeda in Iraq, in Iraq War II. And that was before McCain went and met with them. Then you had the Al-Farouk Brigade. They're very moderate. They want to hold elections. They say that they believe in freedom of religion. Here's a photo of their military commander eating a dead soldier's heart. Uh, and then you go on. Here's, you know, as you said, Noor al uh cutting off a guy's head in the back of the pickup truck. Um, here's, you know, on down the list. Um, I'm forgetting a couple of their names off the top of my head. Of course, Arar al-Sham and Jabhat al-Nusra were the leaders of the thing. And they were just head chopping al-Qaeda crazies the entire time. And... Um, and the Americans just pretended otherwise. They pretended not to know that that was the deal, even though they did know that that was the deal. And certainly, even in 2012, you had the U.S. State Department was saying Nusra is just an alias for Al-Qaeda in Iraq. I mean, that should have been right then and there. Needle scratches off the record. Music stops. Everybody stops and says, wait, <laughs> what? al-Nusra is just an alias for al-Qaeda in Iraq. Okay, and wait, now whose side are we on in this war again? And instead, they just kept going, Henry. They just kept going and going and going until Putin finally came and said, yet, oh, how we must hate and loathe that guy for doing that. You know, otherwise, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi could be the caliph of all of Syria based out of Damascus right now. So something, something that was interesting that happened in Idlib a couple of weeks ago, uh, Sky News was running a report, and then they were uh, with this guy, Bilal Abdul Karim. And I know mm -hmm. Max Blumenthal, uh, a brilliant journalist, a brilliant writer. Um, he did a report, I think maybe back in 2017, how this guy was connected to a lot of nefarious groups. Um, he's been called an Al-Qaeda sympathizer. It's just somebody who's giving him a platform to broadcast on his YouTube channel. And Sky News is running a report with them, um, which I found just bizarre. Because like, Even it, just, I mean, this is a story that you could have been talking about 2013 or something. You're saying this just happened last this week? Ha this happened not last oh. week, about a month ago or so. Okay, yeah. Yeah, they were, Sky again, yeah amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. I mean, they've been caught over and over again doing stuff like that, interviewing outright Al-Qaeda partisans like that, using them as essentially runners as though they're legit reporters out in the field uh, when, you know, as you say, they're clearly biased, which by the way, as long as you're talking about that guy, Kareem, there's also a great report by Matt Taibbi in Rolling Stone about him 
where he kind of differentiates himself a little bit and says, you know, he definitely wanted to cover their side of the story, maybe some sympathies and whatever. But the, the big news there with him really is that the government keeps trying to kill him. Yeah. And they have no right whatsoever to kill him. He has not been tried. Look, you know, there's nothing in the Constitution that says if you oppose your government in war that you're an enemy combatant, that you can just be killed, other than I guess it would be understood that if you're in uniform on the battlefield, no one's going to know it was you until you're dead anyway. That's, you know, something different. But for the charge of treason, it's a civil charge. It's right there. It's the only crime to find in the Constitution to make sure that they don't abuse it and charge people with treason just for disagreeing with the government. They say it has to be an overt act of providing aid and comfort to an enemy. And, it, and a conviction must be based on the testimony of at least two witnesses. One isn't good enough for this crime. It's the only crime in American jurisprudence to find like that. Or a confession in open court would be the, the exception to that. But there's nothing that says that, oh, you go to a military tribunal or, oh, our CIA, you know, assassins get to murder you. If the guy is guilty of treason, indict him for treason and prosecute him for treason. And then send some bounty hunters if you have to, to go arrest him and bring him back and give him a trial. He's an American citizen. That means he's a U.S. person anywhere in the world, no matter where he goes. He is protected by the U.S. Bill of Rights, or it's not the Bill of Rights. Unfortunately, Obama set that precedent where you can kill American citizens when you want. That's exactly the case. With Anwar al and his 16-year-old, everyone agrees, completely innocent, non-terrorist son, Abdul Rahman, who was probably killed simply because he knew too much about his father's previous relationship with the FBI. It's just, it's really, it's really messed up stuff. Um, but something I wanted to, to, to go over, so apparently, like back to Iran, apparently Iran is six months away again, six months away again. <laughs> From, um, I guess, enriching their uranium up to 90% where they can build a nuclear weapon and destroy no all us God-loving no, 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 no. God, no. God Christians in America and Israel as well. I, according, according to, I don't know how long they've been six months away, but I think, what, 12 years or so? Yeah. You it's know, I don't know how many times in the last week I read that they are now enriching up to weapons grade. It must have been at least five or six times. And I almost went back on Twitter just to tweet to some of these reporters and tell them that, listen, if you don't know what the hell you're talking about, then you don't have any business writing about this and making these completely false claims. You know, what is in dispute now is that they're going over the threshold of the amount, the quantity of low enriched uranium, 3.6%. The deal under the JCPOA is they export all that excess uranium. Whatever they're not burning in their reactor right now goes out. It's formed into fuel rods by the French, I guess, or the Russians, and then re-imported and used. That way, they are allaying your pretended fears that they might use that stockpile and enrich it further up to 90% so that then they would have enough material to make a single nuclear bomb which even then they would have to actually make it. And so even when they say, you know, breakout time, conceivable breakout time would be one year. That means one year to be able to have enough fuel to make one, not necessarily to finish actually making a bomb, you know, making a warhead out of it, fitting it to a delivery vehicle, which would be what a flatbed truck. And they're going to drive it where? across Iraq and Jordan to Israel. Is that it? Or I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, no, the whole thing is a hoax. And see, here's the deal though. It's only like 99% of a hoax because the 1% of the kernel of truth in here is that Iran has a nuclear program and they have essentially a latent nuclear deterrent. I mean, they are pretty much stuck between a rock and a hard place, right? If they try to make a nuke, we're going to bomb the hell out of them before they get it done. Now, if we, we're kind of in a rock and a hard place too. If we bomb the hell out of them before they get it done, they're going to figure out how to get it done somewhere. 
They're going to go deep under a mountain where we just cannot get to it and they'll make a nuke there then. And so essentially what's happening is they are proving that they know how to enrich uranium, right? They're letting us know that they have a gun in their nightstand, but the thing is it ain't loaded and they have no intention of using it. And it's essentially, it's a half measure to keep America from making matters worse is all it is. But there's no real reason to believe that they intend to produce nuclear weapons or use them against anyone. And the reality here is that Israeli doctrine says that if Iran has a nuclear program at all, we'll just call it a nuclear weapons program. We'll just consider it a nuclear weapons program. It is tantamount to a nuclear weapons program. They must not enrich at all. And so therefore then that it was the policy of George W. Bush and through most of Obama and Obama in the nuclear deal finally said, all right, fine, you can enrich uranium, but just keep your program under such strict restrictions as to essentially shut the Israelis up that they can't pretend that you're six months away. Now, what's happened here? Trump left the deal. And isn't it hilarious? And there's a great uh, write-up about this in fairness and accuracy in reporting that America left the deal. Iran is in breach of the deal. Well, how is it still a deal if we already left the deal? We could never be in breach, you see. America would never violate the law by leaving a deal. No, we're just leaving a deal. We're America. We can leave whatever deal we want. I actually agree with that. Declaration of Independence guy here. We can leave a deal if we want to. But then we're going to sit there and say that they have no right to leave the deal that we left, that they are, in, they are breaching the deal, that they're in violation of the deal. Uh, when in fact, guess what? It turns out that the language of the restrictions on some of these quantities is actually not a major part of the deal. It's a side separate deal. And actually what it says is that the Americans must refrain from reimposing sanctions. And if they do, which lifting the sanctions was part of our side of the deal. So, and if they do, then Iran can, you know, raise the limits or ignore the limits on how much enriched uranium or heavy water or whatever else it is that they're supposed to produce. And so they're actually not in violation of the deal. That's part of the deal that the Obama administration signed. If we start breaking the deal, then there are retaliatory measures that you can take. We agreed with that. So in other words, as George W. Bush would say, huh, they shorthanded it, right? They are, they are um, you know, essentially exceeding some restrictions in the deal. And so then you just go ahead and say, oh, they're in breach. They're in violation. But meanwhile, again, they couldn't actually start making a nuke and get away with it before we bomb them. Um, certainly not with the nuclear program they have. And there's no way really for them to divert what they have into a secret program. Essentially, the only way for them to get a nuke would be if we started bombing them, then they went ahead and withdrew from the nonproliferation treaty ended their safeguards agreement with the IAEA and took all of their existing nuclear infrastructure deeper underground somewhere, right? In other words, taking the openly declared civilian nu nuclear infrastructure that they have and whatever's left after we bomb it and then taking that deeper underground to begin a nuclear weapons program then. So, in other words, the Hawks are the, are the greatest Iranian nuclear threat with their self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, Iran, just like almost every other country in the world, doesn't want nuclear weapons. They don't seek nuclear weapons. It's just a presumption of a bunch of Hawks that they do. And it's, it makes a great excuse for war because this is how you get the focus group to agree that, well, maybe we have to attack them then. If, as Condoleezza Rice and George W. Bush said, that we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. In other words, we can't wait around for proof because if we wait around for proof, they might nuke Atlanta. <laughs> they might nuke your hometown and kill you in your jammies in the middle of the night. Yeah, that's what I fear every single day. Um, not really. But so 
I think the major problem, though, the reason why the Hawks are able to get away with this propaganda is because most people are ignorant of two things. They don't know the difference between a civilian nuclear program and a nuclear weapons program. They are, they heal. They hear the word nuclear and they just go bad shit crazy. We're all going to die. They think of a Skynet future um, in Terminator. Um, that's number one. Number two, they don't even know anything about the deal in the first place. Like they have no idea what the deal entails. They don't have no idea what the uranium enrichment restrictions were. They have zero clue what the deal actually is and why it was signed. So I was hoping that you could actually right. spread some light because I think by, by far you have done the best work on this um, as far as just putting out what the deal is, why it was a good thing from Obama. And I know you're no Obama, <laughs> you're no Obama sycophant. So maybe for the Republicans who, and, and conservatives who are listening to this, um, uh, maybe you can, you can explain why uh, we saw, what the deal is and why we got into it. Sure. Well, I mean, the deal is this, um, and it is especially right wingers who don't know anything about it. If they know anything about it, it's totally wrong, you know, and you hear it characterized. It, it makes sense as a Republican talking point, but it's just so untrue that it's really destructive to say the Obama deal gives Iran nuclear weapons. I mean, again, that's they're trying to make something of a substantive point. But again, that George W. Bush paraphrase is always perfect. I shorthanded it. In other words, I left out all the nuance, all the detail, and I led you to believe something that is essentially false. So they're trying to say, if they're being honest, they're saying the deal doesn't do enough to prevent Iran from getting away with bloody murder here. And that essentially that Obama just gave them a path right to a bomb. But you see how that's like a figure of speech. You know what I mean? But then they just, they just lock that down you know, and say, Obama signed a deal that gives Iran nuclear weapons. Well, now that's just stupid, okay? Now we're off in total fantasy land. That doesn't make any sense at all. Why the hell would he do that? According, you know? to, according to Republicans, it's because he's a secret Muslim. Yeah, I guess so. But again, you know, think, and this is part of being a conservative, right? Is you don't have to compare the things that you know to the other things that you know. Like Hillary Clinton was running. So if he was really a secret Muslim terrorist, you know, agent of the devil or whatever, why didn't the Democrats just nominate Hillary? You know, they preferred to anyway. The only reason they didn't was because the American people aren't all a bunch of nitwits and understood that, he, no, he's not a foreign Muslim terrorist. He's a liberal Democrat from Illinois, and that's bad enough, but they'll settle when he's up against John McCain, who's sworn on getting us into a war with Russia. So, you know, he takes your breaks where you can get them. Uh, but so look, Obama was under pressure from the Israel lobby the whole time to not do this. And at the end of the day, he said, look, the entire national security establishment, other than the worst hawks, and every sovereign government on the planet Earth, other than the Israelis, support this. And so I've heard the prime minister's point of view, and sorry, pal, I disagree. We're doing this anyway. He said it would be a betrayal of my responsibility as president of the United States if I let Israel tell me whether or not to do this deal. Now, if you live in right wing, pretend just stupid fantasy land, I guess I can't help you. But if you're willing to rub brain cells together and think the thing through at all, the reason every other sovereign government on the face of the earth supported the thing was because it was perfectly fine. Okay. The real deal goes like this. Iran signed the non-proliferation treaty back in 1968. They've had a safeguards agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency all this time, back when Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford were selling them nuclear reactors and trying to build up their nuclear program. They've had a safeguards agreement ever since then. The Ayatollah, after the revolution, left the whole thing off through the entire Iran-Iraq war. They didn't even really start building up nuclear, uh, civilian nuclear infrastructure at all until the 1990s. And the only reason they went to the Pakistani black market to buy their equipment 
was because Bill Clinton's government kept intervening and preventing the Chinese, for example, from turning over turnkey reactors that would have been ready and would have been light water reactors that don't produce weapons grade plutonium. And yet the policy was, no, we can't even accept them having a civilian program that cannot really even be converted to a nuclear weapons purpose. And so locked them out. So they went ahead and went to the black market. And starting only in the Bush years, did they even begin to enrich uranium? And, you know, the Israelis, or I guess the Americans and the Israelis had found out about the Natanz facility before the Iranians had announced it. And yet it was just an empty hole in the ground. They weren't even required to announce it yet. They're not required to announce it until it's six months before they introduce nuclear fuel into the cycle at that facility. So they acted like, oh, we busted them with their secret nuclear weapons program, but actually they weren't in breach of the deal at all. And it wasn't anything but an underground, you know, giant Walmart sized warehouse, essentially, uh, deep underground at Natanz at the time that they discovered it. Well, the Bush administration then had negotiations through what they called the E3, which is our closest allies in Europe, France, Britain, and Germany, and that they were negotiating on America's behalf with the Iranians. At this point, they were spinning no centrifuges, and they were perfectly willing to deal with the George W. Bush government. In fact, in their golden offer of 2003, they offered to completely suspend their entire nuclear program, and Bush turned them down and, in fact, refused to even hear it. I don't know if John Bolton and Dick Cheney even let him find out about this, but anyway. Um, and then uh, the Bush policy was more sanctions, more threats, and we're going to force you to give up your nuclear program. We're going to pretend to believe that you have a secret nuclear weapons program that you won't admit to, and we're going to put all these sanctions on you, and we're going to demand that you allow the... Um, International Atomic Energy Agency to expand their inspections and all these things. Well, the Iranians went along. The Iranians said, listen, as long as we're negotiating, as long as the E3 are negotiating in good faith with us, we will not only freeze all development at Natanz, we will even sign the additional protocol to the safeguards agreement that allows for expanded inspections and, um, you know, heightened accountability for questions and this kind of thing. And that lasted for years until, what, what is it, 2007, something, 2006 or seven. They finally said, forget this, or no, it was 2005. They finally said, forget this, broke off negotiations with the E3 and started building up their nuclear facility at Natanz. Obama comes in, nothing but threats, nothing but sanctions, nothing but demands that they give up their nuclear program again, with the pretension that they have some secret program we don't know about that they're using to make nuclear bombs, what Obama and his government called crippling sanctions on their oil, which it's true that Trump's are even harsher, but that says nothing good about Obama's. Obama's were absolutely a stranglehold on that country. By the way, if you're against sanctions and blockades, virtual blockades like this, you're an isolationist, understand. Uh, anyway. Um, then Obama finally essentially gave in. Now, the way that the Democrats tell it was that the sanctions brought Iran to the table. But that's not true. Iran had been offering to negotiate in good faith all along. It was the Americans who wouldn't. What really happened was they expanded their nuclear program so far that they brought Obama to the table because now they had the technical ability, if they so chose, to turn out one nuclear bomb worth of enriched uranium in less than a year's time. And once they got to that point, what they call the breakout capability, which is really an unfair phrase like assault weapon kind of a thing, because again, just because you have enough uranium to make a bomb doesn't mean you can make a bomb, doesn't mean you can deliver it, doesn't mean it's necessarily even at that point a weapons threat yet. But still, that's what they call it, a one-year breakout time. And that was when the Obama government finally said, okay, We'll go ahead and we'll sign a deal that we don't need. We already have the Nonproliferation Treaty. We already have a safeguards agreement between the IAEA and the Iranians for them to verify the non-diversion of nuclear material in Iran to any military purpose. All of that was all still in effect, and it was fine. 
It's just that it wasn't good enough. Like you said before, people don't know anything about nuclear technology. They don't know anything about nuclear treaties either, uh, whether the JCPOA or the NPT before it. And so as far as the American TV audience was concerned, there's no such thing as the NPT. No one ever said that Iran is within the NPT. Iran has the unalienable right under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to peaceful nuclear technology. They're, they're not in violation. Nobody told them that. They pretended as though, and this was the Democrats, this was the Obama government said, it's either the deal or war. And they pretended as though the Iranians were trying to make nukes. And this deal was the only thing that could stop them. And they did that like for political reasons to try to get the deal passed. But they ended up conceding major lies to the war party that the Iranians really were trying to make nukes in the first place. Um, in fact, the Ayatollah said after the deal that the deal doesn't prevent us from making nukes because we weren't making nukes. We don't want to make nukes. So this deal doesn't prevent a thing that was not happening in the first place, which Rand Paul, to his everlasting shame, lied and misquoted the Ayatollah and said, oh, the Ayatollah says the deal doesn't even prevent him from getting nukes and left it at that as though that was a criticism of the deal, not a criticism of the liars who were pretending that the deal was even necessary in the first place. Are you with me? Am I making sense here? No, you're making perfect sense. And what so I find here, here we get to the deal now. So what does the deal say? The deal says that they get, this is what America gives them, okay? America lifts sanctions. That's it. And America gives them money that Jimmy Carter stole back in 1979. That giant pallet of money that Donald Trump is always talking about, a pallet of cash money, that was their money that America had stolen during the Iranian Revolution, had frozen. It's called freezing when government steals your money. And when the U.S. government does. And uh, in fact, the International Court of, I forget if it's the World Court or the International Court of Justice that rules between sovereign states and cases between sovereign states, they had already ruled that America had to give them back the money. So John Kerry, who I hate, okay, and I hate him better than you hate him or anybody in the audience hates John Kerry. Don't get me started all the reasons why, okay? I hate him. But I don't care about, ha about being in a position of having to give him credit and say that that was actually America's end of the deal. We lift sanctions. We stop aggressing against you and blockading and punishing any country, that, any, any business that deals with you. And we'll give you your own money back that we stole. And that's our entire side of the bargain. It's that's too bad Trump bad. doesn't know that. It, it, it's too bad that Trump doesn't. It seemed like he certainly didn't understand that when he was campaigning, because I feel like a lot of the stuff that he's, what he's facing right now is due to the political promises that he made while he was, while he was running for president. Right. And a lot of those political promises were just, you just wanted another hammer to bash Obama with and get the right wing base surrounding him. Like, yeah, the, Ob the Iran deal was just a complete forfeit of American integrity. We gave the money back and I don't, it's it's really really aggravating when I hear people, and this is mainly from the right, saying, "Why did we give Iran all the, the billions of dollars back?" Like it, it's it's a really aggravating. Well, they don't say back; they act like it came straight oh, out of your paycheck. Exactly, you're right. right. You're right. Yeah, they don't acknowledge this was their money that was sitting on ice for forty years. You know, and then so here's what Iran did. Okay, again, they already were in the IAEA uh, safeguards agreement under the NPT, they already were guaranteed to, have not be, uh, to not be diverting nuclear material. And what they did though, was they signed the additional protocol, all this, essentially just to get them to sign the additional protocol to their safeguards agreement and their um, what they call subsidiary arrangements under the uh, IAEA safeguards agreement to allow for expanded inspections. And so this is one major facet of it. So now, the IAEA can inspect the centrifuge factory where there's no nuclear material, but where they make the centrifuges. They can now oversee all of the mining and every bit of ore that comes out of the mine, never mind whether it's, you know, transformed, refined into yellow cake or transformed into uranium hexafluoride gas or any of that. They now complete womb to tomb total observation of the entire fuel cycle from the time they bring the stuff out of the ground 
Then they poured, um, uh, well, so that's the expanded inspections. No, I'll get, no, 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 let me, let me elaborate more on that. Trump complains, oh, we can't look at their military bases. Well, that's just not true. I mean, again, shorthanding it, leaving out all the detail. What does that mean? That means that the, the Americans or the, the IEA can't just walk right into any military base any day of the week that they feel like it. Well, can you imagine any other country on the face of the earth that would allow that? Okay, right. So now that we're back in the real world again, uh, what, I mean, is that total? No. America, the IAEA can inspect military bases. And here's the deal. And, and the Iranians signed on to this, man. The Iranians went along with this, that if the Americans have any probable cause, any evidence that they can demonstrate to show why they have a suspicion, never mind probable cause or anything, but just a suspicion or a reasonable, I don't know the exact term, but any reason to believe essentially that there's something important to be found out at one of these military bases. All they have to do is convince their allies, Germany, France, and Britain. So if um, Germany, France, and Britain, and the United States vote on the committee, and Russia and China and Iran all vote no, it doesn't matter. It's not like the UN Security Council where if Russia votes no, it's a veto. No. The Americans win. The Americans and their Western allies have the majority on the council that decides. And so if, if, does that make sense? If the Germans, the French, and the British agree with the Trump administration or the American administration's claims about why we need to look at this military base, then Russia, China, and Iran, even if they all disagree and stamp their feet, we get to go anyway. And if the Iranians forbid it, then the entire deal is off and the sanctions, the global United Nations sanctions that apply to Russia and China would have to do this too, under the law, would all quote unquote snap back right into place. So in other words, there is a loaded gun at Iran's head. As long as they can impress the judge, their friend, the Brits, the Germans, the French, that they have enough for a warrant, they can execute it. And if the Iranians resist, the entire sanctions regime on a global scale, kicks right back into effect. Now, that just makes what Donald Trump says about that issue untrue. We can't even inspect their military bases. No, that's a lie. And it's probably something that John Bolton told him, but it's something that's just not true at all. The reason that they can't inspect the military bases right now, Henry, is because they don't have any evidence whatsoever that there's anything nefarious going on at any military base. There is no reason, there's no indication to think that there is. Okay, then, so that's the inspections uh, part of the regime. Then they restricted their program. They took the entire facility at Fordo, at Com offline and reduced it to a research facility. So they're not really enriching and producing uranium there at all. The Natanz facility, they took, I think, two-thirds of their centrifuges offline, went from 30,000 centrifuges down to 10,000. And they agreed to uh, limit their amount of uranium that they hold at any given time to bare minimum amounts that they need for their electricity program at any given time, as we said. They poured concrete into the core of the Iraq reactor, that's A-R-A-K, the Iraq reactor, that was a heavy water reactor that could have produced weapons-grade plutonium as waste. They just ruined it. If you pour concrete into the, into the reactor, you're done. Things over. It's canceled. And um, the Boucher reactor is still a heavy water reactor that produces plutonium as waste, but they have a deal with the Russians to come and take all the waste back to Russia. And they don't have the facility to reprocess the waste inside Iran um, that they could even get weapons-grade plutonium out of it anyway. And so, essentially, Iran's nuclear program was already locked down, already guaranteed to be civilian in nature, despite all the hype you've heard this entire century long so far, or longer. And all the JCPOA did was double extra lock it down beyond your right to complain. That's it. And if you look at the effect of it, look at the effect of it, Henry. Before the JCPOA, it was like the NPT didn't exist. 
when it came to Iran, they just pretend as though, for all we know, they're making nukes right now. What are we going to do? And so maybe we have to have a war to protect ourselves from their nuclear weapons program. After the JCPOA, all that went away. All that went away. Now ask yourself, why does John Bolton, why does Sheldon Adelson, why does Benjamin Netanyahu hate the JCPOA so much? It's because it takes away their excuse for a war. It takes, this is the reason Obama did it, was to take war off the table. And this is the reason that the Israeli-led hawks hate it so much, is because they need this pretext for war. The focus group won't let you launch a war against the Persians over some mustard gas, but they might over an A-bomb. And well, you so know that's the scam. Do you know what's ironic about the whole thing is that everything that, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu accuses Iran of, he himself is actually guilty of. That's right. And not only does, Iran, does Israel have at least 200 secret nuclear weapons, they're not members of the Nonproliferation Treaty. So there are no inspections and they are not sworn against proliferation. See, for example, their arming of South Africa with nuclear weapons in the 1980s. And in fact, guess what? Benjamin Netanyahu himself was in on a smuggling ring with Arnon Milchan, the uh, famous Hollywood producer, to steal nuclear triggers from the United States uh, for use in Israel's nuclear weapons program. Ted Snyder has an excellent piece on that that he wrote uh -huh. a, a, a couple of months ago how with the uh, Netanyahu corruption scandal and how that spread light into his past with Arnon Milchin smuggling kit uh, Krytrons right. out of the U.S. So it's just, it's really funny. So uh, another thing I just wanted to, to, to run by you, it, this is something, a point I made. I want to know if I'm correct on this or if I'm just completely, just totally speculating. So before Trump, Trump officially pulls out of the deal in May, right? May of last year, May mm -hmm. 6th. So yeah, sounds right. at, yeah. same at the same time, a couple of days prior or May 9th, um, whatever the dates are, a couple of days prior, Hezbollah had just won a number of uh, piece, uh, seats in parliament over in Lebanon. And then do you, do you think that like relates to each other or was that just, it, it was always inevitable that Trump was just going to pull out of the deal? Yeah, no, nah, I think, you know, there's only so many days in a year. So a lot of these things are going to tend to coincide. The real flaw in the deal was that the president had to recertify that Iran was cooperating every quarter. And so Trump just hated that, that he had to recertify to Congress how, you know, cooperative the Iranians were. And that ended up being a real poison pill in the thing. And it became intolerable for him um, to not just stay in the deal, but in that way. But I think, I mean, the deal is this too, is that, and I'm not sure which all advisors told him what and when, but it was John Bolton essentially, you know, auditioned for his job as national security advisor by writing a essay in the National Review about getting out of the deal. And here's how to get out of the deal and why to get out of the deal. And that's, you know, and they say that that Bolton actually called Trump from Sheldon Adelson's phone in Las Vegas and said, hey, man, how about that job? And so, you know, huge influence by Sheldon Adelson there um, and who is very closely tied to Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party in Israel, to be perfectly clear about it, and is a declared Iran hawk. In fact, he's the one who said we ought to drop Obama, ought to drop an atom bomb in the desert just outside of Tehran and let them know that the next one's headed downtown if they don't, you know, give up unconditional surrender right now on whatever terms. Uh, said that just a few years ago. Um, and so, um, but I think, I think that Trump doesn't want war with Iran. The, the Army and the Marine Corps have got to be telling him that this is something that we don't want to do. Maybe the Air Force likes to talk real tough, and I don't know about the Navy, about what they can get away with. But in, a, in the event of a real, real war with Iran, we do not have what they call, the Pentagon calls, escalation dominance. In other words, they have a side in the fight. We could beat them eventually, but they could hit our guys all across the Middle East with missiles from without having to leave the house, essentially. And 
There's just no real great way to do it. And what I think is going on here really is that Bolton and whoever else told Trump what he wanted to hear, that we can get a better deal. We want to get rid of all the sunset provisions in there and the expirations on the restrictions. We want to add ballistic missiles. And you know what? While we're at it, we want you to stop back in Hamas and Hezbollah. And we want you to do this, that, and the other thing too. And, you know, that they add on there. And I think Trump was told that, you know, like Kim, talk tough, fire and fury for a little while, and then you extend the olive branch and you have an opening for a real deal. But the problem is that we didn't really have a deal with Kim. We needed one. We had a deal with Iran already. So for him to pull out of the deal that we already had and then just completely bludgeon them and beat them over the head and add all these new sanctions and no waivers for our allies, you know, for China, Japan, or Korea, or anyone else to buy their oil and stay out from under our sanctions and to clamp down and then tell them, now come to the table and sign a better deal. It's just stupid. It's not going to work. You know, the art of the deal, Trump's supposedly this brilliant businessman for manipulating people into the bargains that he wants them to sign and strike, but it just doesn't play out. I mean, certainly in this case, he really set up the incentives all wrong. And he let Mike Pompeo give this, this uh, speech at the Heritage Foundation where he gives them like 15 to 20 demands. That, you know, Pat Buchanan said, this sounds like something a Roman proconsul would be reading to a defeated tribe in Gaul, you know, but this is, we haven't beat them in the war yet. And we're making all of these demands and essentially we're giving the Ayatollah no way out. You know, the Ayatollah, you know, pretty much stuck his neck out to back this president Rouhani in making this deal with the Americans, despite all of the right wing criticism in Iran that you can't trust the Americans. They're never going to stick with this deal. They're going to end up bombing us anyway. And all of these things. And what is Donald Trump comes in just two years later, two and a half years later, he's out of the deal, ratchets up all these threats and leaves no way for the Ayatollah to give in and save face. It's bad cop, bad cop. There is no good cop. And so What's going to happen? You know, I read a headline that said that the French are going to talk with the Iranians next week. But how can the Iranians be expected to give in to a thing at this point? Um, you know, the idea is they will out of pure desperation, but I don't think so. Because I think with that same desperation comes pride. They would rather wait, let Trump twist in the wind, try to make matters worse and undermine his attempt to be reelected and hope they can get back in the old deal with the next person you know, with a a Democrat president next time. So, you know, the art of the deal should include thinking at all about what the other part, the other side of the deal, what the other party in your negotiation wants and expects and is willing to give up and is willing to fight for. No, you're just going to boss them around. They're just going to do whatever you say because why you're Nancy Pelosi or something. It's stupid, you know? And so, I mean, seriously, look at the position Trump's in now. He set him and the Ayatollah both up where neither of them can back down. And they don't even have anything to fight about other than just America picking this fight for no reason at all. As you said, it started out just politics in the primaries. He just had to make sure that no other Republican was going to outhawk him on the Iran deal. So he just said, it's the worst deal ever signed by anyone ever because you can't beat that. And then now he's just bound by that. You know, the whole thing is crazy. And again, I have to emphasize These are the enemies of ISIS. These are the enemies of Al-Qaeda. Whatever lies you heard from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Iran did not do September 11th. Iran is not co-conspirators with Al-Qaeda. They're their deadly enemies. That doesn't mean that I think that we should ally with them. We certainly should not. But we should not let some Likudnik liar shout radical Islam at us to the degree that we get lost in glittering generalities and we forget who are Israel's enemies and who are America's and how much they hate each other. Now they want to pretend that it's okay to have dual loyalty. It's okay to be as loyal or more loyal even to Israel than America because our interests and their interests are the same, but that's just not true. In fact, we look right here at the Sunni Shia split and what we've been talking about with the war in Syria, with the possibility of war with Iran, The Israelis have our government taking the side of Al-Qaeda because Israel hates the Shiites more. 
That's crazy. There's a reason for a massive, giant, and immediate separation, divorce in our special relationship today. And people just don't, people don't, I read a headline, I forget where I read this, but I mean, basically you can just kind of copy and paste this narrative to pretty much everything that comes out of CNN, MSNBC, all the mainstream outlets. It's like Iran, who sponsors terror in the Middle East, is enriching their uranium to a level where they can make a nuclear bomb. It's just copy and paste. Um, from every single outlet, there's very, there's no counter narrative at all. The only places that you can find a counter counter narrative are places like antiwar.com or low blog or, you know, independent media outlets. And I don't blame people for not knowing this stuff because I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit my audience knows that when I was younger, um, younger and dumber, you know, I was, a, I was a staunch Republican and, and, uh, I, I was bought into all this stuff, but then I started to realize uh, what was actually going on in the ground. And, and just people don't have the fundamentals. That's the biggest problem. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. And you know what? This is really a, a huge part of the legacy of Iraq War II. Because I have to say that through the, what, five, seven years of Iraq War II over there, there was every opportunity for TV to say, all right, look, everybody, here's a map, okay? Here's, this, here's the shirts, here's the skins. These guys got the Ayatollah. These guys got the suicide bombs. Figure out who's doing what and who's on whose side, why it is that we're on the Shiite side against the Sunnis in this one, whatever it is. And they never did that, ever, ever, ever. I mean, if you remember the 2000 aughts at all, you know, the, the Bush years, then you remember that the story was that it's America and the people of Iraq versus the terrorists. In other words, just pure lies, just pure nothing, right? They, they might as well have said it's the clouds and the clear blue sky against the terrorists. It's the, you don't need to know who's who over there. When the reality is that, and this goes to, to explain so much of what's happened since then, that Bush essentially believe the neocons that if he put the Shiites in power in Baghdad, that America would have sway over them, would have dominance, and that they would be essentially willing supplicants to American power. And then that we could use that to leverage against Iran. We can't attack Iran, but maybe we can make Iranians so jealous of Iraqi Shiite democracy that they'll go ahead and overthrow their government for us and create a wonderful democracy like the Iraqis have. I actually think that Ahmed Chalabi convinced Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl to some degree that that was actually a possible result of the war, a likely result of the war. And so, and regardless of that, once the Ayatollah Sistani in January of 04 said, we want one man, one vote, that's 60% of the population. That's it. Deal's done. In other words, he was saying, hey, Bush, you want to start the war all over again against the people who stood back and happily watched you get rid of Saddam for them? And Bush said, no. And his bluff was called and that was it. So from that point on, from essentially January 04 on, the Ayatollah Sistani and the Shiite powers uh, led by the Supreme Islamic Council and the Dawah Party, they conscripted America into their army. And America was doing their bidding the whole time in that war. And then, but that's then, Henry, what explains why Obama would take the side of Al-Qaeda in Syria. Bush started it actually back in 07. He finally got it through his head that, man, the Saudi king is mad at us. We just put Iran's guys in power in Baghdad. Now we have to make it up to the Sunni, the Saudi, you know, Arabian kings um, and the Israelis by tilting back toward the Sunnis. But of course, the Saudis don't have really an army. They just have Al-Qaeda terrorist shock troops. And so that meant that Barack Obama, George Bush, and then Barack Obama after him, continuing that same policy, we're backing those terrorists, not because Obama was a secret Muslim, right? But because he was a secret George W. Bush, who was himself a secret Bill Clinton, who backed the terrorists all through the 90s, even though they were still attacking us. He was still backing them in Bosnia and Chechnya and in Kosovo uh, all through the 1990s. And that's because Bill Clinton was nothing but a secret Ronald Reagan. And that's what America does. Ronald Reagan was nothing but Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter said, we back these terrorists against our enemies. 
Ronald Reagan said, that sounds like a good idea. Bill Clinton said, me too. George Bush and, Bill, and, and Barack Obama just followed up. The fact that they hit us on September 11th and the USS Cole and helped kill 4,000 Americans in Iraq War II, eh, well, yeah, notwithstanding. Those are the aberrations, you know? Those are the, those are the squiggles on the line on our page. For the most part, essentially, it's America and Saudi and Al-Qaeda versus the commies, the Iranians, whoever you got. Gaddafi. I guess, I guess the lesson is whenever the, the U.S., France, Britain, uh, Saudi Arabia, Israel, UAE, Qatar, all are on the same page on a foreign policy move, it must be the right decision. Yeah, it must be also on the same page with Ayman al-Zawahiri, the butcher of New York City. <laughs> Scott, I, thanks. To, we're running over an hour. I know you mentioned you had it out an hour. Um, thank you so much for coming on. This is really important because there's a fundamental misunderstanding about basically everything that's going on in U.S. foreign policy, but I mean specifically the Iran deal because there's so many stupid talking points and stupid narratives that are out. And it's really, really difficult for the average person to find actual people who know what the hell they're talking about. So um, your work is just, uh, you know, it keeps me what I'm doing. I wouldn't be able to do this podcast without, without, your, without your work. So uh, thank you so much. When is, um, when is the, you know, the book coming out? I, I mean, everyone who haven't read Scott's book, uh, Fool's Aaron, um, I don't know what you're doing. Go get that book immediately. It's one of the best books I've ever read on any subject on, on Afghanistan, period. Um, the, uh, the, the War on Terror book, or I'm sorry if I'm misquoting the title. Yeah, it's, um, well, so far, the, I, I think this is just tentative. I got to come up with something better. But so far, it's called Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And unfortunately, it's been pushed back a little bit because I was publishing Will Griggs book, um, No Quarter. And then I'm putting out a book of all of my interviews of Ron Paul, 38 of them, uh, the transcripts there. Um, so that's going to be coming out here real soon in just the next few weeks, I hope. And then um, I'm also putting out a book of Sheldon Richmond's about Palestine, but that also, man, if I really buckle down, I should be able to get all these done by the end of this month. Man, time flies by so fast. But then back to work on enough already. And then my plan is I want to have it done and for sale by the beginning of December so everybody can spend a hell of a lot of Christmas money on it and so that it will be part of the conversation beginning in the year 2020 during the presidential campaign. And the goal is essentially, one, it's for you to have everything I want you to know, but it's also for you to be able to give to your people too and say, this is the thing, man. Remember how I'm always talking about that stuff? This is the one for you. So that's the most important thing, right, for the libertarian movement, for the antiwar.com audience, for my show audience, for my people, and for their people. And we all got what we need. But then secondary to that, and really more importantly, is I really want it to have an effect on the presidential campaign. I really want for people to say at least, I don't know, Senate campaigns, House campaigns, anybody. I want people to be able to say you know, in arguments, in debates about power, on TV, in their town forums and whatever, that, hey, listen, there's this new book out that says that we could just quit. We don't have to keep doing this this way anymore. I think you should look at it. And I think people need something to be able to really stand on and say, you know what? Hang on right here, man. I got the thing that'll change your mind. And so that's the point of it. And um, it's essentially, it's the history of everything from Jimmy Carter through right now and why everything, the whole damn war is America's fault and all we have to do to win it is quit it. Well, I'm really excited about it. Everyone also, I, I, I uh, listen to, to a lot of your archives. Um, they're all on, I think they're on YouTube right now. I don't know if there's a better place to find them, I guess, for you, for, for you because you have- Yeah, scotthorton.org. ScottHorton.org. Make sure that you listen to Scott's archives. Um, I've got 5,000 interviews now. Yeah, dating back to 2002, right? Or 2003? Three, right? Yeah, right. 2003, mm -hmm. Dating back to 2003. So if you want to like a education on US, on U.S. foreign policy, everyone just go through Scott's archives. That's what I do. Um, it, it definitely has uh, changed my, my life. So, Scott, thanks again for being on the show, man. It, it's sure. always such a pleasure and honor to speak to you, and um, I can't wait to do it next time. 
Thanks, man. Really appreciate it, Henry.